Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. We are again back to our motivating image. Uh, we are in V2 and we aim to sort of develop algorithms uh, and analyze them and algorithms that will help us drive autonomous systems such as this. So we go back and try to recap uh, what we did last time before moving ahead very quickly. Right? So uh, last time we started by uh, studying a few important lemmas. Right? The first one being on uh, convergence of certain functions. Right? And in this lemma we saw that uh, if you have a function which is scalar valued and with a derivative which is bounded then the function is uniformly continuous All right, this was one of the lemmas right? this was one of the lemmas the other lemma we saw in fact we saw this lemma 1.1 earlier which said that if you have a scalar valued function again and it is bounded below and non-increasing then the function has a finite limit as t goes to infinity okay we also saw examples of what such functions are right? uh, we then uh, studied one of the uh, at least one version right or the one version of the bubble lemma which is uh, one of the very very key uh, lemmas for analysis of adaptive systems okay without uh, babalat's lemma there is um, almost no hope of doing any adaptive uh, systems analysis all right and here in this lemma essentially we say that if a function is integrable and here we could talk about both scalar and vector valued functions right for vector valued functions we look at uh, component wise integrals right so if the function is integrable and uh, further that the function is uniformly continuous then we have that the function converges to zero as t goes to infinity okay uh, we also saw an example of how uh, this um, Babalat's lemma, although it is a sufficiency condition, that is, it's a one-way result. It says that if these two conditions are satisfied, that is, integrability and uniform continuity, then you have convergence to zero, and not the other way around. Right? Not the other way around. Okay. So this is a sufficiency condition, but we saw an example of how this is a rather tight sufficiency condition. We saw an example where if function is um, integrable but not uniformly continuous right then uh, even in this case the function does not actually converge to zero okay we saw that there is in fact no limit to a function of this kind okay all right so moving on we will um, look at a corollary of this right uh, we will look at the corollary of this uh, and we want to say that uh, you know we want to sort of look at a slightly simpler looking condition if i may okay um and this is a more concise statement if you but still remember this is a corollary right so what does it say it says that if the function is uh, such that it is both l infinity and lp for some integer p right where infinity is not included because of course you already have infinity here right so if it's L infinity and LP for some P and further F dot is L infinity, then the function converges to zero as T goes to infinity. Okay. So this is sort of a, um, if I may, a, a, a sort of a different characterization uh, for Babalat's lemma. Okay. Now, like I said, it's a corollary. And so it makes sense to uh, sort of want to know that corollary implies the actual lemma itself 
right and so therefore we do say something like this we say that um, if the function is l infinity and l2 right then we want to prove that uh, limit as t goes to infinity ft is equal to zero right so we essentially want to prove the corollary okay so this is uh, i would say you also want to add here Yeah, also want to add here that the derivative is l infinity so uh, we want to prove uh, that the corollary holds true when uh, this p is equal to 2 okay so the, this is sort of a specific case of the corollary but if you can prove it for p equal to 2 you can prove it for any p no problem and right? so this is um, sort of uh, asking us to prove the corollary using original Babalat's lemma okay so you want to prove the corollary using the original Babalat's lemma statement which is essentially lemma 2.1 okay all right. so I leave it to you yeah, and this will be part of the homework exercises of course all right so i want to want you to give this a shot yeah um if you remember i already said that you know this integrability condition has some similarity with l1 type condition so and you sort of have to use a similar idea here okay that's sort of the hint for this exercise okay now let's see how uh, one might use the bablat's lemma i want to give you a glimpse of uh, convergence analysis using this you know very very cool tool that we are uh, claiming can do so much yeah so you want to see if it can in fact do what we are uh, you know saying it can and it will help us analyze convergence of adaptive systems yeah so suppose we consider this uh, typical spring mass damper type system I mean, you all have seen something like this before in most of your mechanics dynamics you know in high school and so on um, the dynamics of this system is given by this equation okay this is very uh, this equation 3.1 is very standard uh, application of the newton's second law yeah i mean what you would typically do is uh, write think of m as a free body diagram sorry m as a free body and then we write all the forces on it so what are the forces you have uh, something like a, uh, let's see okay there is a sort of inconsistency here this should be so let me change this this should be c yeah this should be c and not b okay uh, so this there is this is a free body there are multiple forces here um, right so this movement is only horizontal so let me try to write this a little bit carefully okay um, so this is the vertical forces um, mg and then you have a normal reaction from the ground yeah i mean which is not really marked here but there is sort of a uh, constraint here yeah to prevent it from you know falling below so that's a normal force and then in this direction we have uh, forces c x dot due to the damper and you have k x you have c x dot due to the damper and you have k x due to the spring all right so again this x is of course this x right depends on this displacement yeah makes sense and then you of course have this user applied force f of t okay and then what does the newton's law state it states that the if i write it in only the horizontal direction in the x direction the newton's law will be mx double dot is equal to 
all the external forces so the only positive force is f of t and then you have minus cx dot and minus kx okay so once i have written this uh, very very concisely the newton's law all right right let's see uh, okay yeah let's see i want to sort of yeah okay so this concise form of newton's law has been written and see let me see if i can make this bigger yeah it looks like i can yeah all right okay So once you have written this very concise form of the Newton's law, you can see that this is exactly what we have here. It is exactly the same equation, just rearranging the terms here. Okay, excellent. So now that I have this equation, I'm going to write it in our standard state space form. Right? And how do I write it in a state space form? By choosing states. Right? So what are my states? I choose my states as x1 is equal to x and x2 is equal to the derivative of x okay, this is the standard way on how you convert anything into a state space form so then what do we have we have x1 dot is equal to x dot which is actually equal to x2 okay so that's the first equation then x2 dot is the second derivative of x and this can immediately be concluded from this equation okay pretty obvious okay all right so these two equations are in fact the same so here i have mx double dot which is essentially mx two dot and then you have cx dot which is just uh, sorry say that i'm sorry there is a small error here this is not states are like this x1 is the x and x2 is x dot okay so x1 dot is x2 and then x2 dot is x double dot which is minus c by m x dot which is x2 minus k by m x which is x1 plus f over m plus f over m okay so now in general as it is mentioned here in adaptive control as well as in non-linear control we typically want our states to follow desired trajectory so it may seem rather unrealistic to you for this particular problem but that is what we always want to do right we want our robots to follow a trajectory we want our spacecrafts to follow a trajectory we want our voltage signals to follow a trajectory and so on and so forth yeah? i mean if you consider any system um, you in, in general want your states to follow a trajectory okay and therefore we define this desired trajectory right so this is uh, we define what is called desired states by just these x1 desired and x2 desired yeah usually uh, you will have to have the x2 desired to be the derivative of x1 this is so that this has to be consistent with the dynamics okay this is sort of a matching condition okay the fact that x1 desired and x2 desired are related in this way is a matching condition okay why is this a matching condition um, this is because if you see for this dynamical system itself x1 derivative is actually equal to x2 okay in this particular case uh, x is x1 is the position and x2 is the velocity right so the position derivative is the velocity okay 
Therefore, in order to have a consistent uh, desired trajectory, you will need your desired trajectory to also have the derivative of position to be the velocity of the desired trajectory. Yeah, otherwise, these are not uh, compatible trajectories and you cannot track such a trajectory. Okay, if I give you a trajectory where x1 dot desired is not equal to x2 desired, then this trajectory cannot be followed by the system. This should be obvious to you. Okay, so that's why this is called a matching condition. Okay, so this makes sense. Yeah, that if your system has position derivative equal to velocity, then your trajectory also has to have position derivative equal to velocity. There's no two ways about it. Okay, great. Now that I have these desired trajectories, what do I do? As control engineers, we are always interested in um, looking at things going to zero. Remember, we always said that our equilibrium we assume to be at the origin and so on and so forth. So we're always interested in going to zero. If you see the Babelart's lemma is also saying that a signal goes to zero. Okay, so because we want to deal with uh, objects that go to zero, we want to create error variables. Okay, because I don't want to look at x1 going to x1 desired because both x1 and x1 desired are quantities that depend on time. Right. So what do I do? I construct an error, which is the difference of x1 and x1 desired. Okay, and this is very standard. Right. And similarly, an error two that is e2, which is the difference of x2 and x2 desired. Okay, so I create these errors uh, corresponding to created corresponding to all system states. Okay, we create this corresponding to all the system states. So here we have two states. So we create two. If you had 100, we would create 100 such errors. Why? does this make sense why does this make sense why do it makes sense is because if this is equal to z if this is going to zero if both these errors are going to zero what do i have i have what i desire i have this implies that x1 goes to x1d and x2 goes to x2d and this is precisely my tracking objective, right? This is precisely my tracking objective that I want my desired quantities to go to the true values. Okay, I hope this makes sense to all of you, right? Because this has to make sense to you because this is what we do in all of our control and adaptive control. We always create error variables or variables which we want to go to zero. Yeah? We always want to create variables that will go to zero. Yeah? And therefore, we create error variables. Instead of looking at the original x1, x2 variables, we look at x1 minus x1 desired and x2 minus x2 desired as my new system variables. Okay, Great, great. Excellent. So once I have these error variables, right? these new definitions right what's the deal i want to identify the dynamics or the evolution of these error variables until now i had dynamics of x1 and x2 but now i want dynamics of e1 and e2 all right and how do i do that let's take the derivative because i have the dynamics of x1 x2 and if i want the dynamics of e1 e2 so i just take the derivative of e1 and e2 that's what I do here. E1 dot is just x1 dot minus x1 desired dot. Okay, this. And what is x1 dot minus x2 de x1 desired dot? It's exactly same as our definition of E2. Okay, and this is not by magic. This is not by magic, not by any distance. Okay, this is by virtue of the matching condition. Point. Right? This is because of the matching condition that you have this sort of a dynamics. So what happens? E1 dot turns out to be exactly E2. Right? So our error dynamics, the first equation of our error dynamics looks exactly identical 
to our original state dynamics yeah okay it's an integrator it's an integrator this is an integrator this is very standard okay in mechanical systems in aero mechanical systems at least to have your indic like an integrator as your first state dynamics all right all right then what about the second state you have e2 dot and then you take derivative of x2 and x2 desired so you have x2 dot and x2 desired dot x2 dot i can plug in from my equations as this guy yeah this is this entire equation that we had from before yeah and you have x2 dot which is say again the double derivative of x1 okay just the double derivative of x1 all right excellent as of now we are assuming i mean we are still not in the purview of any adaptive control or anything we have not even learned what is adaptive control so we are simply trying to understand yeah what uh, you know um, babalat's lemma can do for us yeah how do you analyze systems using the babalat's lemma yeah so um, as of now we are simply trying to do that yeah just to give you a taste of how uh, analysis with babalat's lemma goes um so we assume for the moment that all the parameters of the system are known that is we know this we know this quantity we know this quantity okay so all these parameters are assumed to be known yeah obviously the trajectories are have to be known have to be given to us it doesn't make sense otherwise because if i don't know what i'm following then right what am i following all right okay great so what do i do i Uh, start off by choosing an appropriate control law okay and what is this appropriate control law okay i know um, for a fact that well i mean maybe you don't but i know for a fact that a system like 3.6 okay, that is this guy is a exponentially stable system you already know what is the meaning of this so this is a globally exponentially stable system i know this for a fact Yeah. Why do I know this for a fact? Well, because I'm doing control engineering for a long time, so I know this for a fact. Okay. Now, for those of you who don't know this for a fact, how how can one verify that such a system is, uh, you know, exponentially globally exponentially stable? In many many different ways. Uh, one one obvious way is just uh, the that is this is a linear system. First, we identify that this is a linear system. Okay. and then what do you do you say e is e1 e2 transpose so then you have e dot is 0 1 minus k1 minus k2 e okay and then what do i do i compute eigen values yeah you can do many things once you do this you can once you have this sort of a uh, equation you can do many things you can write the characteristic polynomial and use the routh hurwitz criteria many of you might have done it in your typical first basic control systems course yeah uh, but i mean in this case i can also compute the eigen values directly right um one way or another uh it is not difficult to see right what is what will be the uh, you know what will be the characteristic polynomial of the system it will be something like lambda square plus uh, k1s plus k2 equal to 0 right let's see let me sort of verify this is going to be the case yeah so this is i am claiming the characteristic polynomial okay what is the characteristic polynomial it is simply the determinant of si minus a equated to 0 this is well i mean not s let's use lambda lambda i minus a equated to 0 Okay, I'm simply computing the determinant of lambda i minus a. Okay, so this is just determinant of 
लैमडा माइनस वन के वन लैमडा प्लस के टू एंड दैट इज वॉट आई एम इक्वेटिंग टू जीरो सो एक्चुअली दिस इज द अदर वे अराउंड लेट मी सी सो यू विल गेट लैमडा स्क्वायर प्लस के टू लैमडा प्लस के वन ओके दिस इज वॉट यू विल गेट लेट मी सर्ट ऑफ हाईलाइट दिस नाइसली ओके दिस इज वॉट यू गेट एज योर कैरेक्टरिस्टिक पॉलिनोमियल एंड इट इज नॉट वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू सी using this particular characteristic polynomial right that what is going to be your eigen values it's simply the solution of this it is simply the solution of this okay so what is the solution uh let's see i mean lambda is going to be equal to so let me write here the left lambda is going to be i apologize lambda is going to be equal to minus k2 plus minus okay It's going to be minus k two plus minus square root of k two squared minus four k one divided by two. Okay. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Now, depending on what this k two and k one are, you will get different roots. Uh, but the key thing to remember is that uh, you know this is always. the key thing to remember is that real part of lambda is always negative here yeah why would the real part of lambda always be negative i know that because this quantity in the bracket here that is this guy is always less than this guy this is always less than this okay so because this is less than this the real part of lambda will always be negative again this is something you know from your standard first uh you know uh, first level course in control system so therefore i'm not covering it in too much detail okay but you should know that yeah if the quantity in the square root is less than k this quantity here then the real part has to be negative okay real part has to be negative and the real part is negative i know for both the eigen values then i know that the system is globally exponentially stable okay or of course like i said you can simply use the routh criteria and you know that k1 and k2 are both positive i mean and, and you can continue along and it's very easy to conclude that the system is exponent globally exponentially stable okay so now cool so i know that this equation in blue is globally exponentially stable so what do i want i want this system to follow this system that is to be the same as this system okay because if i can make 3.4 and 3.6 same then i'm done because my system is globally exponentially stable okay great so how do i do that because i know uh, why do i use this target system because i already see that the first equation is matching yeah, if the first equation was not matching then i had no hope because i have control that is this f over m is what is my control the control function right is f is the control function so i have control on the second equation but nothing in the first equation right so the first equation definitely had to match and they do so i choose this target system and so what do i do i choose this f over m in a way that my right hand side becomes this and that's exactly what this is okay i have simply chosen to cancel this guy this this and this okay and that's it i've simply chosen to cancel these quantities right with some new definition here of course you know i'm calling this um, k1 as k by m k2 as c by m okay and then i introduce some nice terms minus k1 e1 minus k2 e2 that is i introduce these terms right here yeah basically this i get from here to here 
by choosing the F. That's it. Okay, that's the M. And I do that. Okay. And so I get that my what is called my closed loop. Okay, this is the what I would call not just error dynamics, but the closed loop error dynamics. That is, I've plugged in the control. Therefore, it is called the closed loop error dynamics. Okay. Now, of course, we know that this system using our, you know, either Routh Hurwitz methods or using our, you know, using our eigenvalue analysis that this is exponentially stable. But what if I want to prove this using Lyapunov methods or using a potential function? This is what we will see next time can be done using Babalat's lemma. Why do we want to do this is because typically nonlinear systems may not have you know such a easy nice structure you may have something very non-linear appearing here and then you cannot use route criterion and so on and so forth okay? your target system may not be linear okay and in such cases you are forced to use uh, non-linear analysis methods and that's what we will see how to prove exponential convergence using babalat's lemma and potential function methods next time okay great so what did we do this time we essentially uh, started to look at how to uh, use the bablats lemma we are not there yet right we'll continue of course next time but we have you know sort of looked at a model looked at a control and looked at an error equation before that we saw an alternative version or a corollary to the bablats lemma which also may be useful to us uh, at some junctures all right excellent so this is where we'll stop today uh, see you again next time thanks